Hi everyone. In this video, I just want to go ahead and show you how to shift the supply of loanable funds curve and what factor shifted to the right and what factor shifted to the left. Now, remember the supply of loanable funds is all the funds available in the financial sector to be loaned out towards um, uh, to be loaned out towards uh, firms and households for borrowing purposes. All right. So we have to think here. Think of S as national savings. Okay, and so maybe up here, rather than calling it S1, to be more precise, I should call it Supply 1, right? Or S is National Savings, and there's two components of National Savings. There's private savings by people like you and me, in other words, households, and there is government savings, right? Now, um, remember, private savings, if I were to write this like this, S private is equal to all your income plus all your transfer payments minus taxes minus oops don't quite have enough room there so it's equal to all your income plus any transfer payments you receive minus taxes and minus consumption so you think that term in parentheses is disposable income and you subtract off consumption and that's private savings all right now public savings or government savings is a little bit simpler right that's equal to all the revenue the government gets in the form of taxes minus all the transfer payments minus all the government expenditures on goods and services remember transfer payments are things like welfare unemployment social security etc G is government expenditures on goods and services, so that's like roads, bridges, military, teachers, you know, things of that nature, where the government gets a good or a service in exchange. So you can think of everything that goes into government savings, meaning taxes, transfers, and government spending, is affects government savings, which will then affect national savings, and everything that goes into private savings, which was income, transfer payments, taxes, and consumption, will then affect private savings and therefore national savings. Okay, so I'm going to do a couple examples, but they're going to be very general, and you can use them once you get the intuition right. You can use it to figure out what's going on with any uh, problem of this nature I throw at you. So for simplicity, let's say in our first example. And let me erase this down here so I have a little bit more room and clean things up a little bit more. All right, let's just say in the very first example we do something simple and we do an increase in government spending. Okay, that means holding everything else constant, what's going to be the effect on national savings? All right, so I've drawn my initial supply curve, I've picked a real interest rate as a reference point, I have Q1 here, so let's call this point A. Right, so that's my reference point. Well, if I increase government saving, or excuse me, if I increase government expenditures, in other words, there's a there's a war, so we buy a bunch of tanks um, and other military equipment. So government spending surges. Then think about what happens to government savings. That's which is equal to taxes minus transfers minus government spending. We're keeping everything else constant, so taxes are constant and transfer payments are constant, but I'm increasing government spending. Now notice there's a negative sign on that in front of government spending. So if I increase government spending, so if I increase government spending, then government savings has to fall. Okay? Well, if government savings falls and we hold everything else constant, we mean we hold GDP constant, consumption constant, transfer payment and taxes constant, then because national savings is the sum of private plus government savings, it's a little crammed down there, but if private savings is constant and government savings fall, then national savings has to fall, meaning the supply of loanable funds or the quantity supply of loanable funds has to decrease. Meaning at this real interest rate, the quantity supply of loanable funds is going to be less. Now how much less, I don't actually know, call it Q2. Well, that means our new interest rate quantity supply combination is going to be at point B. Point B is obviously not on the initial supply curve, so there must be some new supply curve here, which we'll call supply 2, that looks like this. Meaning, an increase in government spending will cause the supply curve of loanable funds to shift to the left. 
Okay. There's nothing unique about government spending here. Anything that causes government savings to fall will cause the supply curve of loanable funds to shift to the left. Likewise, if government savings were constant, right, we kept taxes constant, we kept transfer payments constant, and we kept government spending constant, but let's say we increased, oh, I don't know, say for whatever reason, households decided they just wanted to go out and consume more for whatever reason. Well, then, if you think about private savings, that's equal to income plus transfers minus taxes minus consumption. If you keep income, transfers, and taxes constant and you increase consumption expenditures, then by definition, you're going to end up lowering private savings. And if government savings is constant, but you decrease private savings, then national savings has to fall. Okay? So anything that leads to a decrease in national savings will shift the supply curve of loanable funds to the left. All right, let's do one other example. Let me erase this. And here we're going to do something that's going to cause an increase in um, national savings and therefore shift the supply curve to the right. Let's suppose for the sake of argument that um, in this example the government decides, well, yeah, let's just say there's a decrease in government spending, right? Um, a war ends. Well, what's going to be the effect then? Well, let's think about this. It should be real easy for you to go ahead and figure out, but if government savings is taxes minus transfer minus G, and we're keeping everything constant, meaning taxes and transfer payments we're keeping constant, but we're decreasing government spending, so we're decreasing a smaller, or we're subtracting off a smaller number over here, that means government savings has got to go up. And since national savings is equal to private, and I'll just put P here for private, plus G here for government just to make things a little bit neater. And if I'm holding private savings constant, then there's an increase in government savings, which means there's an increase in national savings. Meaning, at the original real interest rate, our reference point, there's more national savings, which means the quantity supply of loanable funds has increased. How much has it increased? I don't know. Let's say it's Q3. That means the new interest rate output combination is going to be at a point like C. Okay, I'm going to erase this so I can have some room here. So the new interest rate output combination is going to be at point C. Now notice that's not on the initial supply curve, supply 1. So there must be some new supply curve, call it supply 3 right here, and the supply of loanable funds is shifted to the right. Okay? So here you've seen three examples, and hopefully you've got the underlying intuition. Other than changes in the real interest rate, anything that leads to an increase in the national savings shifts the supply of loanable funds to the right, and anything which decreases national savings is going to shift the supply curve of loanable funds to the left. Okay, that's it for uh, the supply curve of loanable funds now.